And with heavy rain and wind speeds that peaked at nearly 300 kilometers per hour, destroying homes and prompting the emergency evacuation of thousands of residents and tourists. Many Caribbean nations have political ties to the UK, France, United States and the Netherlands, relying on them to provide assistance when disaster strikes. Others, like Antigua and Barbuda, are dependent on their own economies and emergency aid from the international community. But as residents and relief workers begin to rebuild the Caribbean, the region must now prepare to meet the possible threat of Hurricane Maria. We're going to encounter some difficulties with winds that we were measuring just moments ago, just hours ago, at 150 kilometers per hour. Today we're measuring them at 200 kilometers per hour and with a lot of water stronger than Hurricane Irma. So obviously it's going to be a difficult episode. With so many problems already caused by these incredible storms, what can Caribbean nations do to prevent further damage? Well, here with us to discuss, Claire Nelson is the founder and president of the Institute of Caribbean Studies. On Skype in St. John's, Antigua, Charles Fernandez is the Minister of Foreign Affairs as well as Interim Minister of Disaster Services. In view Fort Anguilla, Josephine Gums Connor is a lawyer and the advisor to Anguilla's former chief minister. And from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, high school student Julian Bishop. Welcome everyone to the stream. Now let's start here on my laptop with these images, actually an aerial view of Antigua and Barbuda, Barbuda via Google Maps. You can see it here on my screen, surrounded by water, tiny little islands, and then what it looks like today. This is via the two-way on NPR, satellite images showing the destruction. This is Barbuda before Irma, April 2014, and after Irma, this is September 8th, 2017. You can see the destruction there on my screen. Charles, can you describe for us, because it's one thing to look at it in an aerial view, but on the ground, what is life like today, about a week and a half after this hurricane hit? Well, um, it's important to note that we had to evacuate the island because right after Irma, we had Jose barreling down on us. So we had like 36 hours to move all the a population off of Barbuda onto Antigua. Now, Barbuda is about 30 miles by water to Antigua. It was a very difficult task. We were very lucky because we had uh, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela had a C-130 transport plane, and they helped us to move a number of people off. It was our Dunkirk because we had to do all of this in a limited time. So uh, it is something that uh, it had to be done. As regards Barbuda now, we've been very difficult for us to really get started. Right after Irma, we had uh, Jose, and now we're facing uh, Maria. So everything is basically, every time we're ready to get started, we have to shut down again and get prepared. The uh, first thing, of course, we have to do is to clean up with the health issues. You have, I mean, tremendous amount of mosquitoes have started breeding there. You have a few dead animals, you have a lot of stagnant water. Mm. So we're very much concerned as to what is happening on the ground in terms of health issues. And so even at this point in time, we have to address the health issues first and then look towards getting in towards the, the actual cleanup and rebuilding, of course. Mm. Now, you mentioned Hurricane Jose and then preparing for Hurricane Maria. It's really one thing after another in hurricane season. This uh, is a tweet I wanted to show. Uh, this is Hurricanes Jose and Maria spinning in the Atlantic in this geocolor loop. And you can see it from earlier uh, this morning, September 18th. Uh, uh, Julian, we know as of now, Hurricane Maria is expected to make landfall 8 p.m. Eastern time in the north East Caribbean and and one of the places that it eventually is expected to hit is the US Virgin Islands where you are how are people preparing after preparing a little bit earlier for Irma yeah um, you know one of the things I, I, I don't want to necessarily say it's good but um, it could be, be it could be worse is that um, Hurricane Maria is projected to go a little bit south or hit directly to my island because there's three islands in the Virgin Islands so my island which is St. Croix um, luckily, St. Croix did not sustain a lot of damage from Hurricane Irma, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and St. Thomas and St. John are already severely damaged, just like the other northern Leeward Islands. Um, and, you know, obviously they're going to get the effects of this still, so the government is very, very much so um, rushing to get any kind of, you know, to get shelters up, to get sandbags out. 
to do any kind of last minute preparations. Um, I think the government has been very good with how they are um, working to prepare the general public. Our congresswoman, which is our only um, federal representative in Congress, she is doing, she's working, you know, nonstop with her office to, um, to get people connected to their families that, you know, st there's still people who are not able to contact family members and friends in St. Thomas and St. John. Um, because there are issues with, um, you know, a lack of service. People can't get Wi-Fi. People don't have power. Um, St. Croix, we're a little better off. So at least, you know, even though we're taking more of the storm, at least we're probably going to be able to have more time to prepare. Um, but, you know, we're still expecting the worst. And it's, it's an effort every day to be prepared for this. Mm -hmm. All right, so I want to get Josephine in the conversation. Josephine, you're in Anguilla. We got this tweet here um, from someone in the region about what she has found out that she's needed since the hurricanes hit. So listen to this. Kalia said, things like water, clothes, especially tarps for houses that lost roofs, feminine products, toiletries occurred to me first, mostly because they're immediate needs, things one takes for granted. Money comes either way, so it's not to put one over the other. Josephine, what are things that you found are your immediate needs after the hurricane? Well, remember that, first of all, just to put things in perspective, Anguilla is an island, uh, 13,000 residents approximately, and we're 36 square miles. So we're really, um, you know, pretty much a, a, a very small footprint in, in this world. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the nature of the people, uh, we're very, very strong um, and resilient people. Um, this Hurricane Irma was unlike anything that we had ever come across. I think fair to say when they said it was going to be the heaviest uh, hurricane ever formed in the Atlantic, it was true to its word. People in Angola typically use Hurricane Lewis that hit our shores in 1995 and in which the eye actually passed over us. And literally, you know, we were in hurricane winds for almost like 36 hours and it was a Category 4 storm. Uh, so people have, you know, kind of used Hurricane Lewis as our marker. But Hurricane Irma, I, I can tell you, when we emerged um, from our homes, it, Anguilla literally looked like a nuclear bomb had dropped on it. I mean, completely stripped. Uh, so many of our homes uh, lost their roofs, uh, and we were particularly hit in terms of our essential services. Now, just to, uh, again... Um, bring you up to speed. So um, I was one who was very um, boisterous in making uh, a very strong criticism uh, against the United Kingdom, who are responsible for us uh, with respect specifically in our constitution uh, to disaster management. And it was really heartbreaking to know that they, amongst, you know, with us, everybody knowing in advance that this was going to be the right. worst storm ever, mm -hmm. I felt that there was no preparation in place so that immediately after the storm, with so many people, although we typically stock up, we prepare, we make sure you have your water, your food, canned food, etc., with the amount of homes that had been so compromised and so many of them losing their roofs and windows and doors, you know, food and water became an immediate concern. Mm. And within a day or two, <clears throat> Unfortunately, that almost was moving um, to very, I wouldn't say crisis levels, but very close to. So Josephine, as, as you're talking, I can see Julian nodding. I see Claire uh, nodding yeah, there. What do you because think, Because I want to say what is, um, just to support her point, given that they're British territory, even though they're a member of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, the fact is the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, we don't have a lot of, um, like say, ships and yeah, and our coast guards in the region are very poor, uh, therefore they don't have like transport planes. It would have seemed to me that the British, that the Canadians already were steaming south to, to be prepared. I would have assumed the British have been flying south and landing in Jamaica or somewhere to build on what is on the ground <laughs> with the Caribbean disaster efforts to move people from Trinidad or to move people from, you know, wherever to the closest point by ship or whatever. So we'd have those things in place. So I think in right. terms of all the money that has been spent so far in, in doing disaster preparedness, that a better job of really doing the simulations and scenarios needs to be done. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, As a I matter of fact, the, the, the reason why we were particularly critical was because where we are positioned in, in our geographically, we are right next to St. Martin, St. Martin, which is, as you know, uh, an island that is split 
uh, half French, half Dutch. And, and here it was that President Macron uh, of France had positioned his military in advance of the storm. And that, to me, demonstrates a kind of commitment uh, to its territory. And, and, and so uh, I think our criticism, it, it's unfortunate that to this day, notwithstanding that criticism, notwithstanding the fact that so many uh, persons within the UK have, have, have felt and expressed that the criticism was, was completely reasonable, those in Whitehall refused to accept that their response was other than, <clears throat> as they call it, swift. And so I, what you're saying there, I, I pulled up the, this headline here, Hurricane Irma has devastated British territories, so why so little aid? This is in The, the Guardian, and this is actually written uh, by the uh, former Attorney General for Anguilla, so your, your concerns, are, you're not alone there, Josephine. Charles, I know you were nodding your head and you wanted to jump in. What did you want to add? Yeah, well, I wanted to say that uh, one of the benefits of not being a colony is the fact that we got to look out for ourselves. And what the government did <laughs> before Irma hit was to preposition. We purchased a number of relief items in Miami and had them on standby to come into Antigua wow. the day after the hurricane struck. So how far in so advance actually, was that? We, we did that about three days in advance. From the moment we realized the track was coming towards Antigua and Barbuda, we immediately mobilized and purchased, had our uh, consul general in Miami purchase these items and had them in a warehouse ready to ship out the day after. Mm. You know, but in and addition you see, to Minister that, Charles... it, yeah, I was no, going to say, in addition that... to that, you with, 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 you, you're speaking about Sedema. Um, I think that one of the things that is important is that we got to not just wait till after a storm to do an assessment. I think every year before the hurricane starts or the hurricane season starts, I think Sedema should actually send someone to each of the islands to verify that they're in a position to withstand the storm, especially now with climate change and the fact that we may be getting, will be getting, have stronger storms and more frequently mm. storms. And Sedema is a Caribbean disaster emergency management agency that people are referencing. Dan, what are people online saying? So I think right here in this conversation, we're, we're showing the difference between being an independent country and being a dependent territory. Right. Julian, on that topic, I want to bring up this tweet that you sent out on September 4th before Irma hit. You said, Hurricane Irma isn't hitting the U.S. next week. It's hitting it tomorrow. I live in the U.S. Virgin Islands one of the neglected U.S. territories, hashtag we exist. Julian, can you tell me why you sent that out? Well, I, I think the U.S. Virgin Islands, just like the other four un, um, unincorporated U.S. territories, um, which basically means territories of the U.S. that they have us in limbo. They don't want us to be a state, you know, like Hawaii and Alaska, we saw with the last incorporated territories. Um, but, you know, we're often very neglected at that point. A lot of Statesiders know nothing about us. They're not taught about us in their school books. Um, they're not, you know, we're unknown to the majority of the U.S. I'm sure, you know, President Trump didn't even know about us for the majority of the time he was running um, and maybe even after he was president. And, you know, my issue with this was we have tens of thousands of Virgin Islanders, um, just like similar with Puerto Rico, you see, who live in the states um, like New York, for example. And we have family and friends there who are trying to look at the news to see how their family in St. Croix, their family in St. John or St. Thomas is, or see how their friends are, and you know, and to watch out for us, because that's what anyone would do in light of a natural disaster. And you look at the news, and all you would see is that it was possibly hitting Florida in a week. You wouldn't hear, or you would hear a little brief thing about how it's hitting the Leeward Islands, but what they don't realize is there's 3 million plus Americans, U.S. citizens, or citizens or not, who serve in the U.S. military, who stand under the flag of the United States, and we aren't being talked about at all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I put that tweet out, because it, it got me really mad. And, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> someone who, you know, I want to be in, in, in government and politics one day, elected government, and I will, from this day forward, or from before and, you know, for the rest of my life, I'll always believe that criticism of your government is the most necessary mm -hmm. thing. And that's why I believe in the free press, because I think that's the only thing that would get it out. <laughs> and um, I, 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 see, I see Charles yeah. kind of smiling there in recognition <laughs> of that. I want to share with our audience, though, where it is you are to kind of locate this. So here via Google Maps, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and you can see above that is the British Virgin Islands. This is from uh, FEMA. Uh, this is out of the United States. Uh, a view of St. Thomas on U.S. Virgin Islands before and after Hurricane Irma. So, of course, of course, as you mentioned, St. Croix, where you are, wasn't affected that much. This is St. Thomas. You can see the greenery 
and then the scenes of devastation, the brown right there, here's another tweet. Irma caused major damage to the airport in St. Thomas in U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, FEMA is supporting its partners in the response and recovery. Uh, we see that there, though. Claire, is there recognition in, in what Julian was saying? Can you, can you relate to some of that? Yes, um, the, the Virgin Islanders organizations around the country have certainly been um, trying to scrapple to find information. I know there's one group in Atlanta who was literally sending people down by whatever means necessary with literally bags and bags in their hand and to talk about what this idea of things to be sent down given that the u.s would know by now that we have historically as a diaspora been collecting barrels etc one would think that they would fall us into the equation of response and give us instructions like when you have your stuff send it to this area, the military would move it as opposed to, to us having to fend for ourselves mm -hmm. yes luckily we have companies, shipping companies in Florida, shipping companies in Maryland, shipping companies in New York, who are literally giving up storage. Caribbean-owned shipping companies mm -hmm. giving up storage, and this is part of their corporate social responsibility. But still, I think the diaspora still would like to know that as the Red Cross and other agencies begin to organize, and I think this is a little bit improvement, mm -hmm. but given we know it's going to be more, right. now we need to forward us into a proper disaster management Planet said, okay, first responders, we're going to need these supplies, ship them to this point in Florida, and we'll take them from there. So we need to have more, more, more interlocking information sets between the different agencies and the, and the embassies mm -hmm. and the U.S. government that is actually doing a response. All right, so I want to bring the I'll conversation go to... Go ahead, go, ahead. Oh. <laughs> go ahead and then Dan. Yes, Josephine, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say I'll go a step further. And I share completely um, what my friend in St. Croix is saying, because this, and, and this is symptomatic, I think, um, certainly of, of what some of us in the, in the territories of the UK, um, in, I, I should say not the territories, but the Caribbean territories particularly feel. And, and you know, it, it's times like these that I must tell you it hurts, because remember, we are coming out of a colonial past. And until we get to the stage where the partnership between ourselves and Britain actually functions like a partners of equal status, then it's in occasions like this where you really feel the full weight of being a what is still, I, I would term, still a colonial outpost. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that the UK has to address. And, and, and it's no longer, I think, when, you, when, when we wake up as, as residents of, of a British territory and see our country so completely decimated, uh, were it not for our own will and, and our resilience, I, I'm afraid that what the, the UK has come up terribly short. And they now have to position themselves where we have to review what this relationship is all about. And I think it's going to come down now that we are hearing. So for example, just, just to throw this out, um, there is a, there is a, a, a uh, a government um, arm of the of the British government, where it's called the Overseas um, Economic Development Aid, and it's really where there's essentially a pot of money. It's at this point about 13 billion dollars, mm. and where um, for years we have been tackling the UK as to our being able as overseas territories to have that first call on aid. We are still underdeveloped territories. And over these years, we have fought that, and right. there has been no movement. Right. Now, for the first time, now that our comp uh, uh, because uh, and and I should say, uh, the reasons why apparently we don't qualify is because we are considered wealthy. Yet, this same pot of money is open to projects in India, is open to mm -hmm. projects in China, all of which have so much more of a base than we do. And for the right. first time, we are hearing now MPs in the UK. Um, echoing the fact that if the rules need to be changed so that its territories can qualify, then so be it. And this was so, a discussion so Josephine, that should have happened I'd years like to, ago. I'd like to broaden the conversation now just to include an industry that affects all of your islands. Charles, look at this tweet. This is from Sophia, who's a super streamer, I might add. She's in Trinidad and Tobago. Sophia, we're really thankful for your tweets. She says, all these islands depend on tourism for their GDP. How will they earn it now, especially for Antigua and Barbuda? They aren't territories. So, Charles, the high season for tourism is approaching. Are you worried? Well, fortunately for us, Barbuda was uh, decimated. But Antigua is where the majority of the tourism takes place. 
and uh, and he was almost unscathed. Yes, we did have a little bit of problem, uh, a few poles down and so on. But the, the hotels are all in, in perfect condition. Uh, the airport opened um, very soon after the storm. Uh, all the roads are clear. Our harbor is not damaged. So we are in a very good position to continue. And um, it looks as though Mar uh, Maria is going to go south of us. So once again, we have dodged a bullet. We are able to take <laughs> care of the Barbudans as much as possible. And by coming to Antigua, the beaches are still there. The hotel is in perfect condition. Mm -hmm. we'll be, we are already open for business. So I, I think mean, that that is one one thing that we can say yeah. we're very fortunate with. Miss, 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 Mr. Minister, I echo that. You really wouldn't get tourism because from what we're hearing on this side, um, the cost of rebuilding Barbuda will be $100 million, right? And you're already in significant debt. And so some of us were very disturbed that the IMF um, is not looking at providing that resources as a, as a grant fund as opposed to or even as a reimbursable technical cooperation, but really want to lend it at the full price. So this issue about rules, revisiting the rules. If we're talking stress about climate change and the issues of small island women states, the rules around the metrics that are applying to large countries cannot be the same for small island women states. And I've been saying that for right. months at the, at, in the World Bank in Washington, we need a new set of metrics that allow, yes, we might have a high per capita, but the specific issues of small island development states, you have to create a new index that allow us to borrow at the same Agreed. rate as poorer Agreed. countries can borrow. Mm. All and, right, and to, prove your, yeah. and to prove your point, just to extrapolate a little bit on that, uh, two years ago, hurricane or uh, tropical storm Erica hit Dominica, devastated yes. their GDP. Uh, they lost about 80% of their GDP. Yes. Now, Dominica is facing down the barrel of, of Hurricane Maria. No one knows how bad and terrible that will be. I mean, and so, so that is another concern. And Dominica also is an independent country. Now, the, the, to, to, again, further to what you're saying, when one of us gets hit by a, a hurricane, the entire country gets devastated. When one of these storms hits the U.S., it's part of the country that gets hit. Mm. And the irony is we're the least polluters and yet we suffer, stand to suffer the most. Right. So that and, is and the because whole... you mentioned that, and then earlier, because I heard the word climate change, I, I just want to give the very quick last word to Julian because we know that uh, you know the predictions of these things happening and happening to a much greater extent is that much bigger. Take a look here. This is via Facebook, where residents of the Virgin Islands are taking it upon themselves to do something about it. Uh, this is a GoFundMe page to help those who are most hit. If there's one thing that people watching can do for your fellow residents what would you say it is Julian well one thing that's watching is I think the all, all of the Le leeward islands even those that aren't part of the US those that are part of the US I think we need to work together a lot because um, like Josephine said we don't get the support that we need from our motherland so we have to work with each other um, right now for instance st. Croix sent um, hundreds thousands of supplies over to st. Thomas and st. John for relief aid people even illegally went over to st. Thomas and st. John before they lifted the um, you know, the travel um, halt between the islands just so that they could help people who got displaced from their homes, help people evacuate, mm -hmm. um, help people, you know, get medical aid if they needed it. And I think that's really what it is at the end of the day for so us. So you and heard it here first. That's from Julian Bishop. Yeah. Uh, earlier you heard from Josephine Gums, Connor, Charles Fernandez, and Claire Nelson. Much more we could discuss. This conversation will continue on Twitter uh. with hashtag <laughs> AJStream. We'll see you there.